Hi everyone, welcome to Wool and Spinning. My name is Rachel and welcome to episode 177. It is Saturday, November 21st here in the greater Vancouver area of southwestern British Columbia here in Canada. And I just want to welcome you to this place. Thank you so much for being here. I've got it. I've got a piece of hair in my eye. If you're a new or returning viewer, thank you so much for being here and thank you for watching this show. I really appreciate you being here. If you don't mind taking a moment to click the subscribe button, I really appreciate that. It lets you, and also the notification button if you wanna know when videos go live. And to patrons of our community, thank you so much for being here and thank you for being in the live chat. So for those who are sort of new to this place uh on saturday mornings we stream the show for patrons of the show and uh, everybody who joins the the patreon can come to the live streams and um that's what we're doing this morning and then the show goes live to everybody and goes public on tuesdays after the show has been released to patrons so thank you so much for being here the chat is already very very busy i see donna is in here and dagmar carol kelly jenny kathy i think i saw glenda um oh my goodness it's just so good to see everybody lane is here welcome lane i, I haven't seen you for a while um missing your face and it looks like everything is working so wonderful we have a teeny teeny tiny bit of housekeeping just stuff that i like to remind um, people of so that they sort of know what's up and coming we are finishing off our current breed and color study it will end at the end of December and then we will be starting our new breed and color study uh, here we do that bi-yearly so bi-annually i guess is the phrase and the next study me and Katrina will announce on the next wool and spinning radio I think I don't know if we're going to announce it for December or if we're going to wait until January to announce it but the next study is going to be quite large I'm really excited about it and currently we are working on our Char Rollet study which has been going since July so we'll talk about that later in the show but please just keep in the back of your mind that breed and color studies will be starting up again in early January. How I Spin is one of the Patreon tiers that you can subscribe to. There's a vlog and a transcript that goes with that content. Our co-executive producers are part of that content and you get a vlog every month that's literally how I spin. So all of the reflection and all of the... Um, piecing together of how I make my yarns and how I project plan what I would do if I were to look to the future to do more. There's a link for a bonus how I spin vlog in the show notes and that is for everybody to watch and to enjoy. It was sort of a culmination of my breed and color study on the Char Rollet and I wanted to share it with everybody so the links are down below. I also made a new Patreon video for 2021 since so much has happened here over the last couple of years 2020 has not gone to plan for most people and so I made a new video just to update people on sort of what to expect if they join Patreon and what we do here at Woolen Spinning because it's a lot to take in and I know when people first join they find it really confusing and maybe even a little bit overwhelming and uh, I'm here as a resource people in the slack channel if you join the slack channel are there as a resource people will help you navigate do not worry so we are here to help you and everybody is welcome yeah kathy it's funny she says super excited to join the breed and color study i'm really excited about the new year's um one katrina has been working on it for a while and uh i'm excited i'm really excited to share it with you and for her to uh to share her inspiration because it's going to be a little bit different, which is wonderful. There is some more housekeeping and links for various things. It's all in the show notes. Uh, so Wool and Spinning Radio, there was a bonus episode this month, and I recorded that with my friend Rebecca, who lives in Rankin Inlet in Nunavut, which is a northern territory in Canada. It's technically in the Arctic. That is linked down below, and there are links for the books, ebooks, all that kind of stuff, and some of the alongs that we're doing right now in the community. And we'll be talking about the alongs later in the show. So there is uh, lots of time for us to sort of highlight some of those things that are happening in the community. Now, I have quite a few things that I would love to chat with you about today. Some sampling that I've done over this past week, some ripping out that I have done over this past week. 
and washing and re-knitting and so on and so forth. So without further ado, let's um let's get into the show. So, uh, Laureline had to say goodbye. She had to log off, but I'm just looking to see who else has joined us in the last little bit. I think Pat just jumped in and Maggie is here. Um, oh, Eve is watching with her muggle neighbor. That's wonderful. And, oh, Carol's excited about the breed study. Sewing up a baby sweater, eating my breakfast, and enjoying a cup of coffee on this chilly, foggy morning. Hi, Diane. It's good to see you. It was really good to see people yesterday in book club. We had our Jane Austen book club yesterday afternoon. Uh, we're doing Northanger Abbey right now. I'm woefully behind in the reading, unfortunately, but um, I will catch up and because it's one of my favorite books. And it was really lovely to see Charlotte and Diane and Eleanor and Jennifer and Elizabeth. Am I missing anyone? Of course, Becca, because she runs it. Um, oh, it's good to see you, Mars. Hello. So let's start off with a finished object because it is washed. It is blocked. I don't really block sweaters per se, but it is washed. It is seamed. It is done. So let's talk about my Albini. I'm going to pull her up so that she can have the um, spotlight for a minute. As you can see, it is a, uh, we are back to plaid season here. The uh, weather has chilled right down. We're sort of hovering around six, six and seven degrees Celsius. And uh, it's back to plaid and undershirts and uh, tights under jeans for, uh, or under scrubs for at work because it's cold and winter boots and winter jackets. I haven't really broken out my toques a lot this year yet um, because uh, most of the kids' um, extracurriculars, which is soccer for our kids, they love soccer, uh, um, because parents have to wait in the car and we're not allowed to be like at the sidelines watching because we're in another two week lockdown here right now. The But the kids are allowed to continue soccer, the kids are going to school, and I haven't really broken out like mitts and toques and whatnot because I've not really been like outside. I'm kind of more just waiting, but I'm in the car. So it's kind of odd this year because normally I'd be all decked out. So this is my Albini. This is a wonderful sweater pattern by Orlaine Souche. Uh, she's a wonderful knitwear designer if you guys haven't found her. And the uh, one of the things that I really was inspired by with this cardigan was I just wanted something that was a little bit rustic. I wanted to use this particular hand spun yarn from Diz Darrow Ranch. And I have been calling this Shetland all the way along. And I could have sworn that that was what Lori told me when when I got this fiber from her. And I was doing a massive clean out the other day because I've been trying to air out my stash, figure out what I have, looking at projects for 2021 because they don't want to overwhelm myself, myself with stuff for next year, because who knows what next year is going to look like. And I found the Shetland that Lori had gifted me, and I found the label for this fiber. So this is actually 80-20 uh, Romney and mohair. And I had said as I was working on it that it didn't feel like Shetland, and that I was wondering if it was not, that if it was maybe a one of her blends. I was right. So anybody who has gotten four ounces of this fiber from me recently, like since July, I think, this particular fiber from this particular project, it is an 80-20 Romney mohair. Which actually is really kind of cool because um, the gorgeous brown of the Romney with the gray of the mohair underneath is what creates this amazing heathering. So um, my labels got mixed up, I lost them, and um, at least I found them and at least I know, because I found the Shetland, which is good. Because <laughs> I was starting to really wonder if I was going crazy, but I wasn't. 
So let me just move this out of the way so that I can talk about this sweater really quickly. So I washed it this past week. It dried really super fast. I put it on my blocking mats with um, after I had spun it in the washing machine. So we had a really great chat in virtual spin group this past Tuesday about blocking sweaters. And Dorothy is actually in the chat. So I'm really um, happy that she's here. Oh, and it's so funny. She's making my hummus recipe right now. That's awesome, Dorothy. I hope you enjoy it. If anybody would like my hummus recipe, I will post it in the Slack channel under, I think we have recipes, um, is one of our, our channels on the Slack channel still? It is. I will post it on there for you guys. It is to die for and it's easy peasy, super easy. So this sweater is knit from the top down and as I was knitting, I was also spinning the yarn, which I have said how many times on the podcast that I don't like doing. And when I had got, I had finished the body and I had started on the sleeves and the sleeves and the, and the extra fabric in here, it was just, there was a lot of extra fabric. I really didn't like the fit. And I had done the waist decreases per the pattern, but then because there aren't any increases for increasing out for the hip, the bottom, this part of the sweater was too small and it was about four to six inches too small and so I decided in the end uh, to rip it back to the waist which I talked about on the podcast um, I think either last week or the week I think it was two weeks ago now um, I ripped all the way back undid the braid that goes all the way along the ribbing um, and I'll show you guys the back um, there's a braid that goes all the way around the back and I did some detailed photography shots to show you guys. Um, and so I, I ripped all that out, ripped all the way back to about, it was about here. There's a bulge back here cause I've got the sleeves tied and I decided to rip it out before I had washed it because I knew based on my measurements and based on me trying it on that because I had lengthened it, even with washing and blocking it, it wouldn't stretch it out enough to give me a really nice fit. So the way that I wash sweaters, and I'm not sure if I have talked about this on the podcast before or not. I think we've probably like mentioned it. I wash my sweaters in warm water, not hot, not cold, but so sort of warm water, warmer than lukewarm. I don't agitate them a ton because I have had sweaters felt on me in the past. So I wash them in warm water with a little bit of eucalyn or soak, which I add after I have run the water so that I don't have lots and lots of bubbles. And then I gently submerge the sweater. I don't agitate it. I don't swoosh it around. I don't really, really sort of mess with it that much, but I make sure that it's completely soaked, that the water's gone all the way through. And I tend to walk away for about 15, 20 minutes. I tend to just kind of leave it to soak. If I'm really concerned about extra fine fibers and that it's going to felt, then I will stand there for a couple of minutes and then I'll pull it right out. Then I roll it in towels, um, the sweater, I'll roll it up in towels for and, and stand on them or I'll kneel on them so that my knees will actually take out as much of the water as possible. And then, once sort of that excess wetness is out of the sweater, I actually put it into my washing machine on the spin cycle. So double check that you're on the spin cycle. You don't want to do this on your washing machine and accidentally put it on the wash cycle, uh, but on the spin cycle and it'll spin it for anywhere between six and nine minutes, depending on your washing machine. Mine does it for eight. My old one did it for six and that just takes out all of that excess water and allows the wool to literally get its crimp back and get it sprawling back. And that um, sort of springiness and that elasticity, that memory in wool that we all love so much is what sort of brings the sweater back to shape. And then I lay it out on my blocking mat or on my drying rack, depending on the sweater and depending on what I'm trying to do. And I'll either measure it and push it out to measurement so that it dries in that shape and size, or I'll just button it up and lay it out and leave it. More often than not, I do the latter and I just leave it because I know that the sweater is sort of gonna, is is the right size. Cause I'll, I'll sometimes do a quick, quick set of measurements. And it's like, yep, 36 inches across um, the bust, you know, 30, um, you know, 38 around the hip. I know, 
then I'm sort of in the right ballpark and I can leave it um, just buttoned up and laying flat on the blocking mats. So, and then as it dries, it sort of, you know, inches in a little bit and it kind of cinches up and gets that poof back and gets that elasticity, that memory, that poof, that bounce, that sproing, just like when we, what we see in our hand spun yarns, right? You know, you have your hand spun yarn sort of, you know, hanging there, you've gotten out a whole bunch of that excess water, but then as it as it dries, it kind of almost like comes back to life, right? It gets that bounce and that sprung back. So that's what I did with this, as I do with 90% of my sweaters. So the only um, thing that I did since I talked to you guys last was I seamed up the pockets. So those um, are the seams inside. And I washed and blocked it, like I said. So it was just sort of those last finishing things. I talked about the collar last week and waxed poetic about the collar. It fits perfectly and actually if you guys are happy to wait for just a moment i think i have photos to share with you so this was spinning the yarn these were all of the singles i spun the majority of this yarn on my lendrum and then i had done that big two ply skein with all of those um with all of those singles and I thought that I was going to spin this whole thing as a two ply yarn and I ended up doing a three ply. Uh, we talked about that on the show extensively about just wanting that added structure and that added roundness of the three ply to give a little bit of de stitch definition through the yoke, uh, a little bit of stitch definition for the one by one rib and also for the braid, um, you know, I wanted the braid to at least stand out a little bit so that it would be able to, you know, all that work of making a Latvian braid, I wanted to be able to actually see that when you're out and walking around and, um, you know, to actually be able to highlight that a little bit. So here are some up close photos of the sweater. These were buttons out of my stash. I actually have five, I think, five or six. Five more buttons left over from this sweater. This sweater took seven buttons. Um, for when I laid them out, that was sort of what I liked in terms of the numbers for the for for how the the buttons laid out. Uh, I have five left over, and I'm I'll save them. Make sure that I have one spare one in case I ever lost one, and also have some spares for um, uh, maybe for another another project. The collar picked up really beautifully. I was really happy with how that picked up. And you can see that little bit of shaping at the top of the collar there, how it um, just has that nice slanted look, which gives you the larger collar at the back. So it sits a bit higher. You do work short rows as, or not short rows. You do, as you work the, the yoke, you're building down as you go, which I really like. I think it, it creates a really natural line. Um, and it just finishes off the sweater really super nicely and not to have all of that bulk right here of the actual collar is really, really nice. Oh, welcome, Greta. Good to see you. The bottom ribbing detail, I think, Jennifer, is really what makes this sweater. And I saw this uh, photographed on a woman my mom's age. And I was actually going to ask my mom if she would like one of these because she's asked for a sweater next year. She finds that she really feels the cold more now than she used to. And um, I saw, I think this is one of those patterns that like Gentle Morning, it looks good on everyone, uh, regardless of body shape, age, all of that kind of stuff um because i think some you know some of the some of the patterns that are out there are not necessarily what everybody wants to be wearing i think some of them i find some of the patterns for me um i i feel like they're sort of more for like younger people and then some of the patterns that are out there um they're not right for my body shape. Um, and then some of the patterns like this one or like Gentle Morning, I feel like they're ageless. Like everybody can wear them. I think Pat has finished her Gentle Morning. She's in our virtual spin group. And it like she said the same thing that I did. It is such a wearable, usable sweater. So it's nice to be able to hear to hear that about some of these patterns that are out there. The other um, sweater that I'd really like to make, it's in my Ravelry queue, but I know there are people not using Ravelry anymore um or not using it at the moment um 
the other one that I thought was really classic pattern was growing. It's called growing. Uh, my friend Lindsay of Artifacts of Appreciation, she made it. Sorry, I just dropped something. And um, she did a garter stitch uh, button band, or it doesn't really have a button band, but the collar she did in, in garter stitch instead of what's called for in the pattern. Either way, it looks really, really lovely. And I think the the sweater is another like really classic, anybody could wear it kind of a, kind of an aesthetic. And actually the other sweater that I've kind of got on my radar for my 2021 make nine prompt, which we'll talk about in a minute is Fennel. And that is also by Orlane Souche. And I've kind of got in my, the back of my mind, I've sort of got another rustic wool in mind for that one. So it's nice to have some of those ideas and kind of ground, ground me in sort of what I want to do and where I want to go for the rest of the year. So let's talk about my make nine because my make nine, let me just move this out of the way. Actually, it was funny because I was, um, I ended up wearing my Albini. I wore it all week and, uh, I, it's really, really warm without being heavy. Um, you guys know that I have issues with my wrists with knitting and, um, th that sweater, I ended up knitting it on, I got gauge on 3.5 millimeter needles, which is US size. Is that US size four? Can never remember. I Yes, US size four. Hey, well done. And I did all of the ribbing and everything on US size three millimeter needles. Is that how it goes? Uh, I did them. I did the ribbing on three millimeter needles. So three millimeter needles, are those US size three or US size two? Um, and the pattern calls for 3.75 millimeter needles for the body. And then the ribbing and the braid is done with 3.25 millimeter needles, but I just needed to go down just a little bit. And what has ended up happening is with that airy three ply and just all of that, um, roundness and warmth that the mohair and the Romney offer in the sweater. And then you've got the air trapped in the yarn itself and then the layer of the sweater over top of your body where your body is heating that air in that space and sort of trapping all of that space in or that 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 warmth in i found it really warm but not in a unpleasant way like some of my heavy uh some of my heavy hand spun sweaters that i've made in the past they're uncomfortably warm but this one was perfect for our west coast weather and it took the the dampness out because the two days that I was wearing it it was raining quite heavily and it just gets damp and you just feel it to your bones and it um yeah it didn't it didn't sort of feel like that so that was really nice I definitely want to make this sweater again um yeah I love the back hem that's actually the only reason why I wanted to knit this sweater was for the back hem <laughs> very easy to wear Maggie and, and Diane. Um, and actually those extra details, like the pockets, the braid, the split hem at the back, uh, the way that the collar is built in the front of the yoke is built. All those little things add up to a classic sweater that fits really well. Some mindless knitting time where you're just working, you're just working stockinette back and forth so you can make progress, but also just some interest you know you don't want the whole sweater to be mindless but you know you don't want the whole sweater to have to be like every stitch counts kind of thing right so really nice balance so for my make nine uh this is for 2021 i've sort of started to look forward to what i want to do for next year i loved marcia's idea she's hey brownberry she's in the chat today uh watch her podcast um her her idea for make nine is to use prompts. And I really liked that idea because I don't want to add another nine sweaters to my wardrobe. And so I thought that it was a really wonderful way of airing out my stash, pulling it all out and figuring out what I have and what I want to do with it. So I have this Norwegian wool that my, that Amber sent me. And I don't know how to say the name of this. It was a 2016 shearing. Um, K noon. Karma, K 
Kenyon Harma. I, I don't want to butcher the name completely. I know I'm terrible for butchering the, the names. It's a, this beautiful gray, 335 grams. So more than enough to do something substantial, but also more than enough to do some prep. Uh, to do some different preps to see what I what I find and you know what I what I want to do with with these yarn with this fiber. So if I just flip my cameras here, what I decided to do was some sampling. So I know that the light is catching this because of course this is reflective. So I'll just tip it off to the side a little bit and then you guys can hopefully see without um without it being too unpleasant. So this was the carded sample. Let me just move the comb sample off to the side. This was the carded sample and I ended up doing this on my drum carter and I sent it through three times um, to get the, I, I teased them apart. So I pulled them out of the bag, teased them apart, but those little tips, some of them just took a couple extra and I don't have a picker. Um, they took a little, a couple more passes through the drum carter to really open up. But on that third pass, let me tell you, it was amazing. So because though these fibers are quite fine, very soft, um, I just could sit here and just pet this all day. It's just beautiful. And it's got that little bit of halo, if you can see that. Uh, the yarn, I did do it as a two-ply, just to sort of as a starting point. And this is actually the carded fibers here. So this is the carded yarn. Isn't that incredible? The softness to this is unbelievable. And I didn't find that the singles or the plied yarn needed or wanted a ton of twist. So for me, this is actually sort of a medium twist yarn, maybe even on the slightly lower side. And it was surprisingly easy to spin really evenly because it was just such a beautiful wool. Like it just, it just spun like butter and then it plied like butter. I was sort of finding myself seeing or thinking like, I can't believe I'm spinning from hand prepped fibers and hand prepped wool. Like it just, it just felt like butter. It, it, it was just amazing. So this, I kept spinning. <laughs> I got a bit caught up in the spinning process and ended up with this massive carded sample. And so I went back and then I did a combed sample because I really wanted to see the combed wool as well. Um, I find for me personally, I find combing is a little bit more labor intensive on my, and I do it on my hackles. I don't know why it's probably just a mental block. So this is my combed sample. One caveat between these two samples, I, I, to try to minimize the amount of difference between each of the samples, each of the yarns, the singles and the plied yarns. I kept the spinning the same. So both were spun continuous backwards. So that's pinch, pull back, pinch, pull back, pinch, pull back, wind on. Not short backward where you're pinch, pull back, on, pinch, pull back, on. With continuous, you're doing it, you know, however many times. For me, I think I wrote down how many times I was counting. Um... I didn't write it down, but I think I was just default spinning at about five, four to five counts back. So pinch, pull back, pinch, pull back five times and then wind on. Um, and I wanted to do that to just minimize the differences between these two yarns. And you can see that they're not really that different. The top one is the combed. I think it's slightly smoother. I think that it is slightly less haloed. The bottom one is definitely more haloed. There are some short bits in the, in the bottom carded one that I do wonder if in time there would be some pills. The only way to find out would be to do some swatches, which is next up, and to carry them around for a couple of weeks and see what happens. You can see in the singles that the carded singles are slightly thicker than the combed singles. Now. The finished yarns are basically the same, so I don't know if outside the carded singles, if it's air, um, or and if the combed singles were just smoothed a little bit more. I'm not sure, uh, but the finished yarns are very similar, and they're a fin similar wraps per inch. Both of them are about. I think I figured out they were both about 16 wraps per inch, which is a fine sport heavy fingering. 
And then this is the combed, um, the combed sample. And you can see there's still a bit of a halo. I think this is a medium to long wool. Um, even though it's not very long uh, in the staple, like some of the staples are a bit shorter. The crimp looks like a long wool. It's got that curly Q crimp instead of that crimpy crimp. And so those tips are going to uh, pop out no matter what. And you're going to have haloing no matter what, no matter what you do. Um, and I did use the other thing. I did use a little bit of spinning oil. Um, I used a little bit of lavender oil as I was spinning um, and as I was prepping. So I put it on my hands, rubbed my hands together, and I just um, went along the carded prep and squeezed it to get that oil in there. And then on the hackle, I actually just sprayed it right onto the fibers uh, before I started combing because they were just so fly away. And it just tamed that that flyaway nature and gave me, and then when I went to wash these, these are both washed and soaked in uh, quite warm water, not hot, but warm, quite warm water and hung to dry with a little bit of eucalyn. And the oil came off beautifully and this is absolutely clean, clean, clean. So, oh, welcome Zan, good to see you. If you ever need, oh, thank you, Diana. I was pretty sure you had one. You've got that Patrick, Patrick Green one, I think, don't you? Because we've used it before for our Clun Forest, I think. Actually, Martha, she says it looks so soft. It is so soft. And that's the next set of sampling that I would like to do, actually, is to take a bunch of these fibers and, and do a three ply. Um, maybe spin the singles a little bit finer and do a, do a three ply with the intention of it coming out to be a sport weight. That's kind of my next, my next plan. So the comb is a little bit shinier. You're absolutely right. When you put the two of them next to each other, um, the combed one, the top one is a little bit shinier and I have to be completely honest. I combed these, Diana in the chat, um, my friend Diana Twist, she'll appreciate this. Because there are some shorter bits in these, uh, I'll lay them out on the table so that you can see, so we can talk about this for just a minute. I'm just aware of the time because the show is uh, getting long again. Have you guys noticed the last few weeks we've gotten sort of onto the longer end again? I don't mind, as long as you guys don't mind. Um, you can see how some of the locks are a little bit longer, but most of them are not that long. They're sort of about two inches, an inch and a half. So, um, and then some of them are uh, quite long, like three inches. And then some of them are like four inches, but they're really all over the place. Uh, some of them are a little bit finer than others. Like this here looks like a big mess, but it's actually really super soft and super fine. Probably was up around the, um, the neck and the chest. Um, and uh, some of it's a little teeny tiny bit coarser, but like by coarser, I mean like it's just not baby soft. It's only very soft. <laughs> I wish we had like a, a softness meter, like very, very baby soft very soft, you know, slightly soft, soft, like this is like all just on the spectrum of soft. Um, very fine, really, really beautiful. Like look at all of the, this in here. Isn't that amazing? Um, so what I did for the combing though, I have to be totally honest, is I didn't go through and lay on my hackles the, t the butt end of every single um, I am going to do some video of this. I just haven't had a chance. It's been kind of a crazy week. Um, surprise, surprise. I know everybody is in the same boat right now. Um, we, I didn't go through and find all of the, all of the butt ends and lay them on like that. Like I just, I just didn't, I wasn't sort of meticulous like that, if you will. Let me just turn off the, that's our Adobe cloud, um, beeping at me. Um, so what I did instead, and this is where uh, my friend Diana um, will appreciate this, I actually did what we do in Sheep to Shawl when we're doing our competition, is I actually just grab a chunk of it like this, and I hold on to it so that, to keep it relatively intact, and I held, um, I held it in the palm of my hand like this, and I just lashed it onto the hackle. Um, and the reason for that is that in the combing process, it all, it all opens up, and you you get that airy, lovely wool. 
it's a little bit faster and the results are not that much different. And I really like that technique. We Like I, like I mentioned a few times, we, we use it in sheep to shawl, but what I really like is that you end up with a shiny wool, um, a, a, a worsted prep, but it's not true worsted, but you end up with this lovely airy yarn. And because the, the fibers are still slightly not perfectly parallel, it's not all perfectly butt to tip. And um, I really like the, the results and I really love the yarns that we spin for our sheep to shawl often. So I will do some video on that as the months go on and as I get this all prepped and I will show you guys exactly what I mean. So just, just um, watch for that in the new year as I work through this in 2021. I am in no rush. Um, I am not interested in adding another nine sweaters to my wardrobe. I think I have plans to knit three or four and they're very intentional. So that's kind of my plan. Hi, Sarah, good to see you. Certainly speeds things up and gets the job done. Exactly, Diana. There is a certain amount of just getting things done. Like, you know, just being a little bit, you know, just, what's that word? Um, being, you know, efficient, right? I have another old sweater to share with you and I knit this back in, I think it was 2000 and, oh, I'm forgetting. I think it was 2015. It was one of my first hand spun sweaters that I had ever made. And 2016, and then I finished it in 2017. And this was fiber from um, Semiamu Suffix, my friend Margaret, um, who has Suffix. And this was a CVM CVM Suffolk Merino Cross, and it was quite a coarse wool. And I knit it into the Fireside by Jane Richmond. And it was a really super popular pullover at that time that came out that was published in one of her and Shannon's books. And Shannon Cook, if you're not sure who I'm talking about. And after I finished spinning it long draw for uh, Spinzilla that year, 2016, or maybe it was 2015 that I actually did the spinning. 2016 I knit it immediately into that pullover and I never wore it and I never liked it because I just didn't like the fit on me and I didn't like the collar on me um, I don't think that for myself that my shoulders are big enough to hold that big collar so I was ripping it out last weekend because I finally got up the the nerve to pull it out and my mom was like why are you ripping that out like it's such a lovely sweater and I was like let me show you like Rather than me trying to convince you, I'll show you. So I put it on and sure enough, like the collar, it's just too big for me. And so I ripped it all out. I have about a thousand yards of yarn and um, I skeined it all up. I'm not sure exactly what my exact yardage is, but I know that I still have some of this in my stash that I never knit with it. It was originally a gray roving and I naturally dyed it with black walnut. I immediately regretted it because I loved the gray so much, but I, I did it and I'll just switch over. Let me just clean off my table because now there's a little bit of uh, dirt and dust from the uh, Iceland, from the uh, uh, Norwegian wool. The woods publication, the book that we, that I had um, done the Seba Boulen from, one of the other reasons why I wanted to buy that that pattern book years ago when I bought it was to knit the Black Forest cardigan, which is linked in the show notes. And I can link it for you guys here as well in the live chat. And it's a fisherman's rib with quite a bulky yarn. Uh, it's with an Aran weight yarn. The gauge is 14 stitches over four inches knit flat. And so I can't knit. I've talked about this ad nauseum on the podcast. I can't knit with these thicker yarns for any length of time. Anything over about a 4.5 millimeter needle and my uh, wrists, both of my wrists start to act up. 
which is why I knit so much with light DK sport and heavy, heavy fingering weight yarn. And I've talked about that on the podcast before. I've tried different ways of knitting. I've tried different, different techniques and different, um, er ergonomically setting myself up differently. And it, it just, I think it's an overuse injury. I use my hands a lot, just like all of you. And, um, there's really not a way to rest my hand in any meaningful way, uh, that more knitting, is going to fix. So I, um, have just been, I'm, my plan with this is just to do a few rows and put it aside and do a few rows and put it aside. And isn't that a lovely, lovely fabric? It's fisherman's rib, like I said. Um, and you do these lovely yoke decrease increases. It's a top down raglan. So my, my, um, um, we're building, building the sleeves and building the front and the back as we go. And, uh, it's, I, I got gauge on five millimeter needles. Yes. Five millimeter needles, which is U S size. Somebody help me out. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, I just am, I'm really enjoying it. And actually, um, rather than pulling Diana forward, cause normally I would just grab Diana and show it on, on her. I can just pop it on. So basically, um, you're building like that. Um, and you're, you, you increase a little bit at the neck edge to kind of build it out a little bit, but basically the way that the cardigan is, is it ends up with this big shawl collar, um, and it's open at the front. There's no buttons. And, um, it kind of is like, um, like a big oversized jacket sort of thing. So if I can't handle knitting with this and my hands just cannot do it, I will, uh, well, I'll go from there. I'll decide what I'm going to do from there. But this doesn't take a lot of yarn. I think the actual sweater uh, calls for 1,200 yards of yarn. But you guys know, I don't know. I never use anywhere near what, what is called for in patterns. So I kind of just ignore that now because I just, I, I don't know. Like, is it my knitting? Is it my gauge? Is it, I have no idea. Because I get gauge. I have no idea. Mm. That is so funny, Carol. I was watching one of your old podcasts this week and I was knitting it. Oh my goodness, that's hilarious. It's funny because that, I knit that. Um, Nora was two and I remember working on it and carrying it around with me and working on it and doing a few stitches at a time. And I remember thinking at the time that I wasn't really super in love with it. I was in love with it on Jane, but I wasn't necessarily in love with it on my body type. And I've often thought about reimagining it and reworking it so that, uh, cause she released subsequent versions of it on her blog. And I think Instagram was just kind of starting to be a thing at that time when that pattern was released. And she had uh, released one where she had buttoned it and I think you could rework the collar so that it would be really quite lovely and you could have a toggle button, a couple of toggle buttons here and, and have like, um, yeah, a more finished neck edge that would fit my shoulders a little bit better. And my shoulders aren't small. They're the same width as my hips because I'm a true hourglass, which I've talked about on the podcast before. But for whatever reason, the way that the collar is, it, it just doesn't quite work on my body. So, yeah. Oh, Sarah, that makes me feel so much better. She never uses the amount of yarn either. <laughs> That's so good. I'm so glad to hear that. So that is that. And then let's move on to the last unicorn sweater. So this is actually commercial yarn. This is for Nora for Christmas. And this is out of Let Lopi. I'm calling this the unicorn barf sweater. Um, she, I told you guys the story about this sweater, but let me just lay it out so you can really see the, the, yoke you'll notice that there's no more purple um hearts on it like i had shown you last time i actually after polling the virtual spin group i actually ripped it all back and started again so i ripped back recast on and i restarted it it was so big on her i have gauge so i don't know what is wrong um with with my knitting or what i did what i did wrong the Nora is a 26 inch chest 
with a t-shirt on 25 and a half without a t-shirt on and but with the let low piece she's probably going to have to wear a t-shirt underneath and she'd probably want to anyways because she'll get too warm and then she'll want to take this off so oh and she was wearing her uh littlest shore cardigan that i made for her she wore it to school the other day it was so lovely the buttons that i put on it though are a little bit too small and I need to put on bigger buttons for her. So uh, this was this was that sweater. I just linked it in the live chat for you guys to see that one. She wore it to, to school. Um, anyhow, her chest uh, at the nipple is uh, 25 and a half inches. With, and then with the t-shirt on, it's 26. And um, she put it on and I had knit the 28 inch chest for her to give her a few inches of positive ease, two inches to be exact. And I would knit it a little bit longer for her and then she would have it for a really super long time. Well, she put it on and it was, a, it wasn't even a poncho. It, it could have fit. I think I mentioned this last week. It could have fit somebody with a 32 inch bust. Like I could even put it on over top. It was obviously too tight for me, but like it fit me. I wouldn't have worn it cause it was too tight, but like it's way too big. So I ripped. So after talking to everybody, my Pat, who is here today, um, she had a really, really good point. And I, it really resonated with me. And I was thinking about it later. And what she said was Nora likes these colors and she likes this particular sweater and this particular design now. So rather than looking to the future and having a sweater for her to wear down the road that she may or may not like, why not just knit it to her size now and she can wear it now. And that really resonated with me because I think we think of our knitting as like we're putting all this work into it and we want it to last for a really super long time and we want it, the kids to wear it for a long time and we need to knit extra long sleeves and have them fold it back and blah, 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 blah. And like the reality is just let them wear it now and when it doesn't fit anymore, if they want another one, make another one. <laughs> I guess I also say that from a place of being a pretty fast knitter and this is worsted weight and it knit up really quickly. Like I did this entire chart in a couple of hours one evening. So I do say that from a place of recognizing that I am quite a fast knitter. Um, but I did rip it out and I went down and I am knitting the, what size am I knitting now? Cause I had to go down quite a bit. Um, let me just have a quick look. Wrong project. Here we go. So I ended up knitting the 24 inch bust instead. So I went down two full sizes for her. So instead of knitting the 28 inch and I was going to go down to the 26, but because this was so big on her, I decided to go down two sizes and knit the 24, knowing that it would still come out bigger and be a 25. So she tried this on the other morning. I do have weird stitch holders for my sleeves this time around. I don't normally use these for sleeves, but it was what I had on hand and it was nine o'clock at night and it was um, just easy. So what I got her to do was just to pull it on over her body. Oh, this one's the smaller one. I can't wear this one. <laughs> I was thinking it was still the bigger one. I got her to pull it on just like this so that her, her arms were down at her sides and just pull it on over top. And it was, it was perfect. So that is the update on that. This is let low P like I mentioned. Um, let me see if I can give you the colors. This is the pink. And this is the gorgeous pinky gray blue. It's got dark, dark purple in there. It's the reason why I'm using this yarn is this color. Uh, this is colorway number nine, four, two, five. 9425 and the pink is 9477. So those are the colors that I'm using for this for this sweater. So really affordable and um unfortunately, I only used about a third of one ball of this purple. So I will have to find some other projects to make for her. Um, and I did get the purple, like I mentioned, and I ended up not working it in when I worked it the second time. This color is 9555. 
The purple is, so all of these three colors are in the other three, the other two colors. That's why they coordinate together so well. Um, but I think what I'm going to do is rather than trying to work in the purple, because the yoke was deep enough without the added hearts, um, I'm going to do a couple of kind of like stars around the wrists and the bottom of the sweater with this light purple, um, kind of like this actually, this motif in here um around the cuff and the the lower hem before I do the ribbing but this I'm going to save for another project for her um I'm gonna have tons of the pink left over anyways and I can either make her another sweater of her choosing or maybe we'll do something a cardigan and we'll steak it or we'll do something because I have a lot I'm gonna have a lot of yarn left over fortunately unfortunately I've always had that problem with kids sweaters. When my boys turn five, they can actually wear all of their two-year-old sweaters. Standard sizes don't work. That's really good to know, um, Megan, that you've had the same problem. Really, really quick, this little skinny yarn I pulled off my uh, wheel last night, but we were watching a movie and I wasn't paying attention to my plying and I have to put it through again because it's not tight enough. You can see how uneven my plying was. Some of the angles a bit tighter and some is a bit looser. This is Polworth and Silk. It is from West Coast Color. I had spun the rest of this. I had about a hundred and no, 300 grams, I think, of this fiber in total, three braids of 100 grams each. And I thought that it was all spun and ready to go. This was originally going to be the background on a shifty sweater, but um, that kind of ended up going by the wayside. And I, when I was airing out my stash and whatnot back in the summer, I found this little bit of fiber that was left over. There were eight nests of stripped comb, of stripped top from that spin that I had never spun. I think it just got separated. So anyways, this is um, the last little bit. I did it last night while we were watching the movie Onward. If you guys have not seen it, we've watched it a million times now. It's James's absolute most favorite movie. Um, this is not washed yet, because I'm gonna put it back through the, through the wheel, but I thought I'd unskein it and show you. Um, it is a wonderful movie. It's a bit of a tearjerker, I'm not gonna lie, but it's a wonderful, wonderful movie and very creative. So big recommendations for Onward. Uh, putting the yarn, great question, Linnea. So putting the yarn back through the wheel, basically what I'm going to do is I will, let me move the cameras around a little bit. I will put this into a center pull ball and then um, from, I usually do it from the center. I attach it to the leader from the center, from the strand that comes out of the center pull ball. And I'll just set my wheel up for plying again. So it's already set up for plying. So I'll just, um, you know, continue on sort of thing. By setting my wheel up for plying, all I do is put a slightly higher uptake than I normally do for spinning and just make sure it's running in the opposite direction. So when I put it back through to ply a bit tighter, I'm still going in the S direction. I'm not messing around with twist direction. I just want to up ply basically. I just want to tighten it up. And so I will attach it to the leader, just loop it through like I normally do and then just add more twist and let it go on to the bobbin a little bit faster just to tighten up the twist a little bit. And basically what I'm looking for is the twist angle of about 45 degrees, which is what I did with the other skeins. Then I'll wash it and I'll have all of the yarn from this spun. I had done some sampling of this fiber back when I had originally done this spin and um, I, had originally thought about mm, putting it with other colors and doing a shifty and then I'd sort of abandoned that idea um but I'll do some sampling and I'll see I have some um colors from Lynn that would actually work really well for a shifty uh sweater it's a mosaic uh mosaic knitted pattern by Andrea Maori for those who aren't familiar I have the pattern and yeah that's that's that was originally what this was spun for you can absolutely do it from your swift diane i just really like doing it from a center pole ball the chart from the last unicorn sweater was actually exactly what i was thinking and putting it on a hat martha yeah great minds think alike what 
I'm just taking a moment to have a look at what you guys are, um, I don't want to miss questions. Uh, I'm almost done with the body on my shifty, says Sarah, second time through as I change the colors around. I'll try to remember. To oh, I'd love to see a picture, Sarah, please. Because I always come back to that sweater and then I think, mm, and then I go and look at other stuff and then I come back and mm. <laughs> so. Um... Yeah, you could do that too, Diane. You could wind it onto a bobbin with your on your wheel and yeah, and and then ply from the bobbin. Absolutely. Yeah. If you've already set the twist, can you run it through the wheel, tighten it up? Absolutely. And then yes, you need to give it another bath. Yeah, absolutely, Zan. I way back when I first finished this yarn, I one of those skeins was it wasn't adequately plied either. I had plied it too quickly and the, there wasn't enough twist in it. And um, I did the same thing and I had to tighten it up and put it back through my wheel. So, um, and then I just refinished it. So definitely doable. Our yarns can, we can push our yarns so far. I think we forget how far we can, we can push our yarns. Uh, even after they're finished, they're not truly finished until they're finished. For November, for our community participation, tell us about your favorite items that you've made based on a feeling or an emotion. So this is from our 51 yarn spin along that we're doing this month for November, uh, looking at emotional yarns and emotional spins and uh, projects and inspiration that are uh, a result of, uh, you know, maybe a life event, an emotion, a feeling, something you're trying to work through and something that you're trying to let go of. I, if you could, if you would like to comment on the, um, Ravelry thread, um, and be honest, if you don't have anything like that, just say, um, that doesn't prohibit you from, from still participating. Um, the com you can comment in the episode thread on Ravelry, which I have linked in the live chat. So for those who are watching later, the links are still there for you and the live chat is still there for you to, uh, watch along and sort of re-experience what we create here or just comment here on YouTube and I'll include those comments in our um, conversation. So I wanted to share my emotional yarn with you and this was inspired by my friend Liz of Kingdom Fleece and Fiber Works. So she had sent me some of her rovings to um, play with and to spin and I had spun a bunch of them and then I kind of got bogged down with other projects. And I've left the bag of rovings um, in a basket that sits next to my side of the bed. And this gray one just keeps calling my name. And one of the things that we were chatting about in virtual spin group a couple of weeks ago now was spindling and spindle spinning. And I just don't get onto my spindles enough. And I really commend Dorothy and Eve for pushing me and constantly reminding me that, that we need that we all need to spend more time spindling and playing with our spindles. And of course, I'm always inspired by my friend Diana, who's here today because she is such a beautiful spindle spinner. And um, so I decided to pull out my favorite Turkish spindle, um, which is uh, one of the turtle made spindles. And the reason why I love this one so much is because Jen of Turtle Made, um, this is the Turtle Made um, logo on the back side. I had seen this color, this sort of pinky corally color available um, for 3D printing and I asked her if she had it and she said she had one small piece of it and would I like uh, a, low, a lesser shaft and a larger shaft in that color and what colors would I like to go with it and she custom did that for me. So it just has a special place in my heart because it was so kind of her. And um, I have decided that for my uh, emotional yarn through Advent that I am going to work on spinning up these rovings on my spindles and forcing myself just to have some quiet spinning time every day. Because let's be honest, it is uh, there's a lot going on in the world right now. A lot of us are experiencing a lot of stress and strain. I think many of us are finding continuing to be at home really challenging and really hard. And um, Advent is coming up for us. Um, I know not everybody celebrates Advent. Um, many of us celebrate many different things. We just had Diwali here um, and there's Hanukkah and of course, you know, Advent. And uh, I think for many of us, we're finding ways to reconnect 
or to continue to connect with our making, but also to connect with others. So for me, that is what I'm going to focus on through the Advent season. And I also um, kind of splurged. It's my Christmas gift from, from Mike. Um, I got um, an, a spinning Advent um, kit from Liz, which I'm really exciting, excited about. So just something thoughtful and meaningful to do every day to kind of center and remind ourselves that this too shall pass, but it's hard in the meantime. All right, let's talk about you guys. So Maggie finished her breeding color study. I'm so excited to share this with you. So I uh, finished knitting her waffle shawl the other day. This has been a really interesting exercise. She posted previously about the spin itself, but basically she spun singles. They weren't the most even, and at times during the knitting, I broke the singles to remove really thin spots. I've done that too, Maggie, it's smart. Um, it doesn't happen too often, but I thought it was best. I like to finish... I like the finished shawl, but I think it's going to be going in the gift pile as these are not colors that look good on me at all. One other reason I found this spin so fascinating is that I love this fiber in the bat so much, but didn't much care for it spun up. Very interesting. It's interesting when that happens, hey? You have this braid of fiber and you love it so much, or you have a bat and you love it so much, and then you spin it up and you're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> it's interesting how that happens. That's not at all meant as a criticism of the dyeing, but trying to understand what it is that I loved so much in the bat and why it didn't translate to the finished yarn or FO. It's like those single skeins of yarn when I love it in the skein, it, but not knitted, which can be frustrating, but also thinking about how else I might approach those. Perhaps this yarn would have been much better suited in color work as, with a contrast color. This was overall a great study and I'm looking forward to the next one. Thank you so much, Maggie, for sharing. And I do love your shawl. Um, I think you did a really beautiful job and I get it. Like sometimes, um, you know, we have these high hopes for a project and we're, and then it, it's a matter of taking a step back and trying to figure out um, uh, where the learning is. Well done, beautiful shawl. Marjorie just shared this uh, last night and this morning. So I was excited to pop this in at the last minute. Um, hello all. I haven't joined the group often, but check in here once in a while. I faithfully watch the live stream every week though. Hi Marjorie. It's good to have you here. And I am joining today to share my Charolais breeding color study project. I have finished spinning and knitting everything. So here is my story. I split the combed bats in about four times and spun the colors in repeating order. I spun to four bobbins and made two two ply skeins. I knit the fingerless gloves one part one part skein for each and then use the leftover skeins to knit a cowl. I use the pattern called toolbox mitts and toolbox cowl. I have to say uh, it hasn't um, it's already scrolled through but I love the cowl like love it um, which worked really well with the hand spun. I saved the waist short fibers from combing and made some Rolex on my hand carters for some woolen spinning. Isn't her spinning beautiful? Isn't that gorgeous? For those who don't know, that's a Lendrum DT, a Lendrum double treadle wheel for those, because I always get questions about that. Isn't that amazing? I love, I love the, um, the headband. I thought these patterns were just perfect for this yarn. I kept the colors in the same order and spun the roll legs end to end and I made a two ply skein with the yarn and knit a headband in with a twist pattern by Morella Moments. E nice easy pattern using only a small amount of yarn. The comb charolais was lovely to spin when the longer fibers were together but sometimes it was awkward when short fibers were mixed in with the long. The resulting yarn was smooth and even but not as soft as you really want for a cowl. The carded short fibers made a more airy yarn, but still not really soft. My thoughts on this project, I am pleased that I figured out a way to use the waste fiber after combing. The results from combing and carding became clearer in my mind. I think that's why um, exercises like this with my um, uh, foreign wool, my Norwegian wool explorations is so helpful because you're absolutely right. It's just getting it all straight in your mind about how these yarns are different. I was surprised at how much calmer I felt dealing with the toned down colors. I think for me, there is way too many strong colors competing for attention. You're like me, you like calm, calm, subtle color, uh, Marjorie. So one of our alongs that we're doing in the, um, 
the Ravelry group and on the Slack channel is a tin can knits along. This was something that was inspired by all of you guys knitting tin can knits patterns. I was working on a love note, which I have ripped out. Um, I do plan to make another one eventually, but you guys have continued to share your projects. And this is Dana T28 girl. I just love this photo of Dana. I think, I think she's, it's just beautiful and the color on her. So this is her finished love note, really beautifully well done, uh, Dana. And I think that I saw this on Instagram as well. So some of you have probably seen this photo of Dana, but I thought it was just gorgeous. She also did some projects for her, I think it's her grandchildren, uh, but I didn't want to share children on the web, on the podcast without explicit permission from the parents. So thank you, Dana, for sharing those photos in Ravelry and on the Slack channel and stuff, but I just didn't want to throw them into YouTube. Now this is Megan's uh, tin can knits. I love these toques so much. Uh, she needed some Christmas gift hats for her nephew and brother-in-law. This is the Banff hat. Great pattern. The brown is commercial yarn from her stash, but the trees are bits of hand spun Shetland that she had left over. Great stash busting. I may knit a couple more of these. Uh, yeah, they're awesome. I think actually James would really like this. Uh, if I've got some yarn in my stash that would work really well for the trees, and I think he would actually really like a toque like this. So you've really inspired me. This is from Britta. I just, oh, this sweater. Oh my goodness. Just like Dana's. I just saw this and I just swooned. Uh, Britta, this summer I spun eight different yarns, merino tops, inspired from the book Unbraided. So that's the book that Katrina and I wrote, um, together and that's linked in the show notes, but I did not want to knit samples. And when I found the pattern driftwood, I saw the possibilities to test also a new, a new way of shoulder, uh, and neckline knitting. Um, because the sweater is knit top down, but it's a contiguous construction. So it was an opportunity to sort of do a couple of different things. Um, so she knit top down with eight different small skeins together of yarn that she had spun from the, from the fiber. I don't know how to say this, Jamit land. I'm not sure exactly how to say that. Um, what I like with this test knitting from the unbraided skeins is that I have parts in the yoke knitted plain. The body is knitted around with longer rows and the arms have shorter rows. So you can really see how the yarns work up differently. And you can see bits like places in the sweater where she's got uh, the, like where it's chain plied and the colors are really clean or like in a traditional three ply, you can see them all laying out here. It's just absolutely a perfect photo of all of the different ways to spin that same fiber. Isn't that cool? Really beautifully done, Britta. And I like that you put it with that creamy white because I think it really sets off those colors. Um, you know, the really jewel tone without clashing. Cause I think if you would put gray as your contrast color, it would have really made it quite washed out and quite dull and black would have really set it off as well. But I think the white really gives it that pop really beautiful. This is our final community share. I'm super excited to share this with you. This is from Rebecca. Um, Rebby J, she's also on the bonus episode of Woolen Spinning Radio this month, which is also linked in the show notes. So for our 51 yarns, she's part of group A. Uh, we're working on not intended and a new natural yarn, uh, which was part of our October uh, 51 yarns study. Group B is working on, I can't remember what they're working on this month. It's all such a blur right now. Um, I know people are catching up. I think Linnea is working on catching up with group B. Um, if you guys post your photos in the Ravelry thread, I, I will be able to chat about your study as well on the live stream. So for those who are sort of catching up with their study, do, do make sure that you're sharing your photos. So group A, uh, not intended. I did two yarns for this one as well. I've only shared one of them here just because it, I knew the show would get long, but do have a look on the Ravelry, um, group for her other yarn because the other yarn was absolutely beautiful. I'm not sure if um, Rebecca's here today, but I think her other one was done with Kiviet and Muskox. It was something, it was something really, really cool. Um, here it is. Um, it was Muskox. Musk oxen. It's a hard word to say. <laughs> Anyhow, this is her not intended. This was made from a mess of strings that came off some fabric pieces that I put through the wash. 
I spiral applied them with some leftover Raimi singles. The skein looks really junky, but the individual strands look really cool. I think they need to be woven eventually. I also spun up some cassette tapes, and the result reminds me of a little bit of wicker, but with this funny smell, almost like burning plastic, which kind of worried me. A new natural yarn, she had lots of fun this time spinning the outer guard hair of musk oxen. So I did include it, but I didn't include the photos. I'm sorry, you guys. Let me see if I can pop it in really quickly. Sometimes things get lost in translation um, because of just um, having a few different things sort of happening throughout the week. And as I'm adding things and as I'm finding things to uh, share with you guys, sometimes it kind of gets lost in the, um, yeah, just lost in translation. So uh, thank you for your patience and I'll add in her musk oxen yarn. Um, totally different. So the outer guard hairs by themselves made a sort of twine, though, to be honest, it kind of really weirded me out. I realized later that it was because the guard hairs have the same texture and length as you guys can fill in the blanks. Um, gave her the heebie-jeebie dance, but she wove up a wee sample and it seemed like it would really make an amazing rug yarn, like for a doormat. She also spun a wee sample of the guard hairs with a little bit of kiviet mixed in, which was a bit different, much nicer to spin and feel, but it looked like a mangy animal. And it's interesting because this yarn, when I saw it, when I was scrolling through the Ravelry uh, thread, and I saw it, it actually really, the, the musk oxen, it really reminded me of the caracool that I spun for the double coated study because the outer guard hairs, cause you spin a whole bunch of different yarns for that month's study. I think that one's three or four months into the study when you do the, the uh, guard, the outer, the double coated wools. Um, it was really, really rug-like. And it made me think of those uh, tapestry weavings that they do in, um, oh, like New Mexico and whatnot, where they, where they use those fibers, um, and they have, and they, they create these like really sort of rug-like tapestry weavings. And some of them are for rugs and they're just really hardy, um, yarns and they make, um, a really kind of almost, um, like canvas like uh like heavy canvas or like a burlap sack kind of that type of a fabric so yeah really interesting so i thought that was interesting about what um what uh rebecca was saying about that really rug kind of twine like um fiber so thank you so much for joining me today. We've had quite a long show. Um, I really enjoy sitting here and chatting with you. I could do this all day, but obviously we can't be here for, for all day. Um, I really hope you guys have a wonderful week and a wonderful weekend. We've got a, the sun's kind of poking through the gray right now, but I don't think that it's going to last. I hope that, um, I hope you guys, uh, stay safe. Please wear your masks and wash your hands if you're going to be out and about. And then we can maybe, you know, keep the load off of the healthcare system and off of each other a little bit, a little bit less. Um, and uh, I hope you just really enjoy your making and kind of lean into be, being cre creative. And if you don't feel particularly creative at this time, maybe find something that's just really comforting to work on. You know, maybe a bit mindless, find some Netflix stuff to watch. I just finished watching the first season of Virgin River. It's on um, Netflix. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was really good. I haven't read the books, but um, I really enjoyed the the show. So if you're looking for some stuff to watch, um, yeah, I hope I hope there's some stuff out there that you guys can share with one another that's maybe maybe inspiring, maybe a bit mindless, a bit silly, just a good escape maybe. And I hope you guys just have a really great weekend. So thank you so much for being here. And um, have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Queries and Explorations is meeting next. Uh, we'll get started sort of in the next couple of minutes. And then we'll formally get up and running in about 15. Um, Queries and Explorations has sort of become um, more of like a bi-monthly virtual spin group. So if you're interested, I think there's still space for one or two more. 
and um you know I, I hope you'll think about about joining us and just gathering with some like-minded spinners you know people who are interested in the same stuff that you are um we don't have to have all the same views about the world but we can certainly share a love of making yarn and being together so without kind of waxing poetic for any any longer i hope you guys have a great week and i will see you next week same time same place happy spinning happy knitting happy dreaming happy all the things. I'll see you next time. Bye.